How's it going? <laughs> we'll give everybody just a minute to get on here. Um, we got anybody logged on? I can't see them. Five people. Mm -hmm. Yep, we got a few people. Who do we have on here? I can't see the comments the way it's uh, set up here. But maybe Heather can let me know. Hello, Stephanie. Hey, this guy. I'm going to we'll give everybody a few minutes to get logged on. We had to uh, make a change. YouTube. Uh, Threw a curveball at me this afternoon, so we're gonna switch it up. We're gonna switch it up to Facebook Live, and hopefully next time we can do it on YouTube. So after YouTube gets a grip and decides how they want things to how they want things to operate, yeah. here we got on, babe. Let's see what we got. Y'all say hello. This is Camden. And you might have saw him in the YouTube video, the second one we made, where yep. he was walking. He was and oh, um, yep. He was he was walking around with a Nerf gun, and he said, "Don't shoot the rain." Okay. All right. Say hello and Harper. This is Harper. Mm. We'll give it like one more minute, and then we'll get started. Hey Chris. Terry says hello. She yeah, says, hey, I can boy. see the comments now. They, weren't, they weren't popping up a minute ago, but now they're this. working. All right. This is gonna be a fun video. Camden. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started here, I guess. Um. So one of the one of the principles that um, yeah, Stephanie said hello and, and hey Ann, I appreciate you logging on here. Um, so one of the principles of Dyson Apiaries was uh, it, it wasn't just to, to become a commercial beekeeper and you know be this big pollinator or something like that to sell nukes and all this stuff. One of my one of my passions is is talking about beekeeping and. Um, so it's kind of an interesting interesting um hobby i guess or i'm, I'm kind of at the sideline level at this point um, it's one of those things it's difficult to, to get into just off the cuff without having some experience before but you know i don't want to say that you can't do that so that, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today i'm just going i'm just going to talk about about 15 minutes of some very basic stuff and then I want to give some opportunity for some question and answer. Um, but that, that's one of my passions. I, I like to talk about bees. I, I think it's a really an interesting. I'm fourth generation. Um, I take for granted some of the things that I know just because I grew up around it. And um, I have my dad who runs Triple J Honeybee Farms. Um, also a master beekeeper. So um, I, got, I got a lot of experience just kind of not even with intent it just happened so uh, I want to share that with people as as I grow my operation and, and try to help other people get started we um, I focus my nuke sales more on the hobbyist I don't focus on the big commercial beekeepers I'm not trying to sell five and six hundred nukes in a year you know I just want to sell the few that and, and and help mentor those people and get started so so I'm gonna take about 15 minutes and, and some of the things we're gonna talk about is just, I, I get the same question all the time is 
how do I get started in beekeeping? And that seems to be, I bet I, I, bet I answered that question 50, 60 times this spring, um, starting, starting December, January, and, and going up until present with people wanting to maybe buy a nuke or a package or something, and um, they just, they would ask that question, how do I get started in this? I'd really like to get started in this, but I don't know what to do. So <clears throat> that's, that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about. And so the very first thing I always say to anybody who asks that question is education. Um, we have to educate ourselves. If you if you watch the news here recently with the air quotes the uh, murder hornet that everybody's calling it's the Asian giant hornet. Um, I made a post in North Carolina State Beekeepers Association Facebook page the other day. I was talking about as beekeepers we become this person that that people ask questions to about things insects you know anything related to an insect or a bee and. We, we may know absolutely nothing about a hornet, but we end up having to talk about it because we're beekeepers. So, so I say I say educate yourself for two reasons. One is we have to know what we're doing and try to learn as much as we can about what the honeybees are. You know how do, how do we um, how do we manage the honeybees? How do we keep them alive? All these different things, but also being able to be that resource or that authority for people who ask you questions about honeybees or, or about a murder hornet, you know, to be able to tell them exactly what is going on with that. So educate yourself. So one of the things that, um, one of the, the main books I, uh, Harper, can you hand me that book? So I kind of, I don't want to like endorse books, but, um, this, um, uh, this Daydamp, Daydamp puts out this uh, First Lessons in Beekeeping book. Um, it's, a, it's a good resource. It's uh, some basic stuff. Kind of give you some basic information on beekeeping. It's got some good pictures in it. Um, that's a really good little starter resource. And actually gave this book away this week for getting up to 500 likes on our page. So that's a good resource to start with. Um, and the, the next one is, is probably my favorite and it's written by uh, Dewey Karen and Lawrence Connor and Dewey Karen's actually spoke a couple times at a couple of our um, a couple of our state beekeeping meetings and I really enjoy listening to him speak he's a professor of entomology at uh, I think it's University of Oregon. Oregon is it University of Oregon? Is he's that right? from Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think he's an adjunct uh, professor at a couple others. But this book, Honey Bee Biology and Beekeeping, is my number one recommendation for anybody thinking about beekeeping, even if you've already been in beekeeping for years. I think it's a fantastic resource. Um, excellent pictures. It's it's set up like a textbook, so for a good resource um, for reference, but it's also a good read. It's it's not it's not boring to read. Maybe the first chapter when it's talking about the history and all that stuff, uh, it it may get <clears throat> it may get a little bit mundane, but after you get through that first chapter, or so it's a great book to. It's a great book to read and, and, and read again and, and read again and read again. Just, just continue to uh, try to understand more you can, as much as you can about honeybees. And, and what I like about this book is it goes from all levels. I read this book t two or three years ago and I grew up beekeeping and I still learned a lot of information from that book. Um, but when I was reading it, I, I, could, I could see how someone brand new could still learn quite a bit about beekeeping as well so I recommend that book so again how do I get into beekeeping first step education so you need to do some reading you need to do some studying uh, check your sources there are a lot of um, there, there's a lot of YouTube videos out here and and there's some books that, that are questionable uh, on some of the tactics or or methods that they're using so you know you need to check your sources make sure that you validate what what you're what you're hearing or reading about um, make sure that it's uh, referenced to other places as well that, that's always good just like you know when we write papers we have to reference things so we uh, 
you want to validate that. Um, so I want to I want to throw it real quick. If if you wouldn't mind, like I said, I had some issues with YouTube this week, and I want to do this on YouTube on a on a regular basis. If you wouldn't mind, jump on my YouTube channel, Dyson Apiaries, and subscribe to that. I need to get a, a few more subscribers so that it unlocks some things for me, so that some capabilities happen here. Um, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, there's links to it on my Facebook page. You could just go down that left-hand column on the desktop view, and it's my YouTube channel's there. I'm not sure what it looks like mobile, but you can hit you can hit that up. If you wouldn't mind doing that for me, um, I would appreciate it. And at the end of this uh, little short talk, I'm going to give an opportunity for questions. So, and the questions don't have to be, it doesn't have to, you don't have to lock these questions down to just how do I get started in beekeeping. It, it can be anything beekeeping related. So, anyway. So, so Brandy has a good question you might be segueing into. Yeah. What is the average yeah, cost? I saw she asked the question about what is the average cost. So, I think I'll kind of answer that question here in a minute as I kind of get get going. So what I'm going to do is, so first step is education. Next step, you need to join an association. I think that's really important. So uh, the, all the counties have have uh, local associations like Davey has one, Iredale has one, Forsyth has one. And then as we expand out of, you know, if, if anybody watches this that's, that's on now, I know like one of the, the coastal states has a, uh, multiple counties are, are together in one one association and a few things but um, then we have the state association in North Carolina uh, it's really strong uh, it was uh, I think there was around 500 people at the uh, at the state meeting in Newbern this spring it's always some fantastic speakers so join an association that, that that helps with that education part and, and it gives you that networking piece so that you can start uh, reaching out to maybe some more experienced beekeepers um, validating some of the things that you're reading about and I think that's uh, it's probably the next step so the other thing we always talk about is what do I need so that's it's kind of a loaded question and it's it's, it's often pretty difficult to uh, to answer via email or or telephone or anything like that it's really nice when we can just show and tell so that's kind of what we're gonna do here and I'll kind of mention some some prices as we go go along and that may help answer your question brandy um so one of the first things we need to do i hope everybody can still hear me if you get to where you can't hear me let me know i'll try to speak up a little bit one of the first things we need to do is get protective gear um this is a pretty new one i just bought this one but um so we have a veil um, a couple different versions of b veils this is one that's a tie-in veil. So you would wrap a string around your waist and kind of hold this down over your head so that you keep the bees out of your face. There's other versions like this that zip in. Um, that veil's about 50 bucks. Just, um, and this is a, uh, it's called an inspector's jacket. If you notice it is kind of, it's, it's just the upper part of the body. Then they make full coveralls as well and you can zip those in to the veil and when you do that you become completely encapsulated and the bees really can't get to you or <laughs> they'll find a hole if you if you make them mad enough but um, this is a pretty handy one you can just throw on pretty quick uh, then there are gloves as well I don't recommend gloves to anybody I know a lot of people when they get started in beekeeping they want to put gloves on too and you know, my dad told me this years ago too, you, you end up mashing bees when you grab frames. So if we're grabbing a, if we're grabbing a frame and there's bees all over it, if, if I grab that frame and I have gloves on, I can't feel what I'm doing. So if it's just my hands, I feel that bee as I'm grabbing that frame and I move that bee out of the way and then I pick the frame up and I don't mash the bees. So <clears throat> I don't recommend using gloves. You're, yes, you're going to get stung on the fingers from time to time, um, but you will also get stung on the fingers with gloves. They can sting you through gloves, and it does it does happen. So, um, I don't recommend those. Uh, maybe if you're doing some kind of cutout or something in a house or something like that, and you're cutting the walls out and you're completely disrupting the colony, yeah, that's the time for complete protective, encapsulated duct tape your gloves on, and you know the whole works. But but for normal inspections, you know. A veil, maybe an inspector's jacket. That's that's enough. 
Um, we have to learn how to work the bees gentle, and as we do that, we we get to the point where um, we don't have to uh, we don't have to use as much gear. So my dad there says nitro gloves. Yep, so that does work. <clears throat> Um, so the next thing is we we have to have um, so we talked about protective gear the next thing we need tools um, so one of the tools is a hive tool um, I'm gonna show you two and the reason I show you this is you're gonna lay one down in your apiary somewhere and when you do that you're gonna need the other one and you'll find the other one later by two you need two uh, two hive tools. Um, these are pretty nasty looking, but um, this is kind of the standard hive tool. So I think they're ten bucks or something. Um, this is I think it's called an Italian hive tool. Um, it's just a, a different method. I, pretty much everybody in the states uses hive tools like this, but you know you can try something else out if you'd like. So, <clears throat> um, the other thing you're going to need is a smoker. Um, this one's actually still burning because I was working bees this afternoon. But um, this is just the basic smoker. This is the tall version. You can get a shorter one that's a little bit cheaper. Um, but bellows, uh, it pushes air out of the bellows into the bottom of the smoker and you know gives you a nice cool smoke out of the top. You, you can much? burn any. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can use them. I use pine needles most of the time, or leaves. Um, you can you can use uh, cedar shavings. They work great. Um, they even make some smoker fuel at a lot of the beekeeping places that you can put in there. You kind of got to light most of that stuff with a torch. But pine needles work just fine. No reason to uh, get too crazy with it. Uh, this is a guard on there to keep from burning you. Uh, a lot of times, I end up with the holding the smoker. You know, when I'm working bees, it ends up being there while I'm doing something with my hands. So, you know, it kind of keeps you from burning yourself. But <clears throat> you got to have a smoker. And the reason we use smoke is uh, the bees, when, when they go into a, a defensive mode, when you open their hive, they're going to they're gonna go into a defensive mode and they put off a pheromone. So the bees, as you, as you educate yourself, you can learn different things about the honeybees one of the number one ways they communicate is through pheromones so when you open that hive they're going to put off this pheromone and it's one of the acetates i can't remember the uh, the, the full name but it's an acetate and it smells sort of like bananas um it's a similar smell uh so with the smoke we kind of mask that scent so it, so if one bee puts off that scent the other bee beside of it doesn't get excited as well so what we're trying to do is keep the colony from getting in a in a full uproar in, in defensive mode. So, um, so we gotta have we gotta have a veil at a minimum, maybe an inspector's jacket or coveralls, hive tools by two, and a smoker. That's your basic tools. That's really all you need um, as how far much? as tools go. How much? Uh, that's and by the way, that smoker's probably 30, 40 bucks. Um, Another thing a lot of people use is a brush. Um, I find that I hardly ever use it unless I'm, I know dad uses one every week when he's grafting because we don't want to shake the larva or shake the bees off of the frames because it shakes the larva so we would, he would brush the bees off of there. Um, but brushes have a tendency to kind of aggravate the bees too. So you don't really use one much. You can usually just shake the bees off and, and move on. So. But that's another tool that we keep in the shed. Um, another tool that you'll need as you're making honey is a nine frame spacer. And I'll talk about that a little more here in just a minute. So that's a nine, just one version of a nine frame spacer. <clears throat> so if we build the hive from the bottom up, we have a bottom board. This is just a basic bottom board. There, a lot of your commercial guys will use pallets. Um, they're with a bottom board built in them, so there's four way pallets. This is a basic bottom board. There are screened versions where this bottom is cut out and there's a screen. Uh, it's one of the IPM strategies for Varroa mite. Um, it's reversible, so if we look at it this way, 
that is a smaller entrance than if we flip it this way. This is three quarters of an inch. I typically I always run mine like this. Uh, we need to make sure that when we get them that we paint this part right here because it is exposed to the elements. So, <clears throat> Lauren, I have honey anytime you want it. <laughs> um, so, so we need a bottom board, uh, 20 bucks probably. Um, ballpark, if you're just buying one, you know, we can get some quantity discounts. So, we have the bottom board. The next piece that 90% of beekeepers probably use um, is, a, is a deep hive body. We, we use the deep version here. Um, there are three different depths, three primary depths in the Langstroth hive. Um, so this is the deep, and then I'll show you a medium and also a shallow depth as well. 90% of beekeepers in, in probably in the United States, I, it's kind of anecdotal. I don't want to throw you know this kind of random information out there, but most people use a deep on the bottom. So they go from the bottom board, they put a deep next. And within the deep, we put frames. So this is one type of frame. This has got, uh, this is a wood wood frame with plastic snap-in foundation. And this is actually, they started drawing on this piece right here. If you see, you see this uh, little bit of wax right here. So they've started, they've started drawing that out, as you see there. And that's just a kind of random fun fact. It takes uh, eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So, so this is our this is our deep. So I'm gonna set this on the bottom board here. I don't know if you guys can see that. I think you can. So we have a bottom board, then we have a deep. Um, there's a couple different ways we can set it up from here. The bees need about 30 to 45 pounds of honey around here in zone seven to make it through a winter. So when I show you a shallow, I'll show you a shallow super like this. This is shallow frame. It's uh, five some odd inches deep here. Um, that's a shallow, That if that is completely full of honey, that's about 30 pounds of honey. So that kind of gives you a reference number. A deep frame would have about seven, eight pounds of honey if it was completely full. So, <clears throat> so the next, the next box could be a shallow on top of here. The next box could be a medium. I'll show you one of those here in just a second. Or you could run what everybody calls a double deep, uh, which would be just another one of these. And that the bees need that much. They need a, at minimum a deep and a shallow around here, in my experience. To uh, yeah, thanks, Dad. Five and five sixteenths. Thank you. Um, so you need at minimum a deep and, and a shallow for winter. We do run some, some nukes through the winter and things like that, but there's a little different management strategy to that. Typically speaking, if you have a, a full, full colony, you need a, a deep and a shallow. So I'm going to show you real quick before I move on what I was talking about with a nine frame spacer. So, okay. Can, can you, can you hear me better now? Is that better? I'll talk a little bit louder. Um, so I was showing you the, the uh, plastic foundation a minute ago. This is actually crimped wire foundation in a shallow frame. So it's just a little different, um, little different type of foundation. So if you notice the wires here, and this is real wax here, um, it's, it's pinched in with a little wedged bar here. I'll do a video sometime on how to properly put together a frame. I see a lot of problems with that. But for this, I'll just kind of show you what it is. So the bees will draw out from here. So if this is a honey super, so I'm kind of jumping ahead, but we built the bottom of the hive. We got at least a deep and a, and a shallow for the bottom of the hive. So the next thing we put in there would be a queen excluder. I think there's one on my truck down there. I forgot to grab one. So <clears throat> a queen excluder, it's debatable whether or not people use them. Some people use them, some don't. Um, some people say they're honey excluders. 
I found that my queens, if I don't put an excluder on, will go straight through that honey and start laying honey, uh, laying eggs in, in my honey supers. So then I have that to deal with. So I use honey, uh, uh, queen excluders. But so if we put this, so we, we built the bottom of the hive and then we put a queen excluder on there. And that queen excluder lets the workers go through, but the queen can't. Queen's a little bit bigger. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put a honey super on. So right now, as we're speaking, the tulip poplars, the tulip poplar tree and the blackberry bushes and things of that nature, those things are blooming right now. And that's what the bees are working. We call it spring wildflower. Um, so I'm going to put that on there. So if I'm putting foundation in, it's always important. There's, there's two different types of uh, hives. You have a 10 frame and you have an 8 frame. This is 10 frame. That's the industry standard. You can use 8 frame. It, it, this is what it is. Always put at least 10 frames in these boxes if it's a 10 frame box. I've seen people put foundation in and space it like nine frames and you end up with burr combs. Until you get the foundation drawn out, you you have to, yeah, that says vetch, vetch, vetch. That's exactly right. Vetch is blooming in the hay fields like crazy. So after we put the, after we get this foundation drawn out and we extract honey off of it, it's going to look like that. So I've I cut the cappings off of that last year and slung the honey out of it. So now I have this nice drawn foundation, right? So <clears throat> when we put that back next year for our honey supers, when we put that back for our honey supers next year, it's already drawn. So what we can do is we can use this nine frame spacer and we can only put nine frames in this box and what that allows the bees to do is to draw that comb out just a little bit wider than this piece of wood and so when we go to uncap it when we're getting the honey out of it we don't have to dig our knife in beyond that wood we can just go out it will be drawn out past that wood and we can just slice that capping right off so we use nine frames after the comb is drawn out the first time. And that's what that nine frame spacer was for. So that's a, a, an important tool to kind of have in your in your tool shed. You don't have to have one. You can kind of just manually space them. I do a lot of times because I forget to grab the thing. Um, but that's nine frames. So that would be, at this point, a honey super. And when that's completely full, that's about 30 pounds of honey. And to put that in perspective, 30 pounds of honey is about a half a five gallon bucket. So for every one of these shallow supers, that's about a half a five gallon bucket. So I'm talking about a queen excluder. Here's the queen excluder. Um, and it just sits flat on top of the bottom box. And through that, the worker bees can go up through that and deposit their honey, but the queen and the drones cannot. So that's a queen excluder. Again, debatable in its use. Um, sometimes the bees do struggle a little bit with going through it, but it's if you have a really prolific queen, she will end up in your honey supers eventually and lay eggs all in your honey. So then you have to deal with that. Um, did you keep bringing these? Yeah, I did. And then Kirk had a good question too. So one other quick thing on the foundation, there's a couple other kinds of, so this was the crimped wire and when we're, when we're putting it in, there's a paper on here to kind of keep it to, from sticking together. So when we put it in, that's our uh, foundation. Um, and there's also another type. It's called a thin surplus. And this, notice how thin that is. You can almost see through it. That is, uh, that's, again, pure beeswax. There are no wires in it. So what we can do with that is that's how we get our cut comb honey. So it's pure beeswax. We could nail that into a frame. And at the end of the season, we could, they would have drawn comb out off of it, filled it up with honey and capped it. And then we can slice out for, um, we can slice out for cut comb honey or, or um, uh, what's the other name they call that? Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, so, so that's another type of foundation that we have that we use from time to time. I wanted to show you a medium super. So this is a, a medium, and this is actually an eight frame. Um, notice it's a little bit narrower. 
there's only uh, five frames in there now, but there's only three more to go. So we can see, uh, maybe you can see that it's, uh, it's not quite as wide. And it's also a little bit deeper than that shallow. So I think there's six and a quarter. I think that's right. So um, anyway, that's a frame without the foundation in it. Like I said, I'll do another video on how to put the frames together and how to put a foundation in. And then the other things, we, we need to close the hive up. So here's an inner cover. This is what we put right below the telescoping cover. The purpose of this inner cover is, the, especially in the wintertime, as we have uh, the heat rising up or the moisture coming up out of the hive, it hits the cold outer cover and then it will condense and make it rain back down on the cluster. So the purpose of this is to keep that um, temperature differential from being there. So it allows the, it allows that air to come up through that hole and out through this little vent right here. So um, that's, a, that's an inner cover. The next thing is a telescoping outer cover. This one's blue, but um, it's got a piece of metal, like a trim coal type metal, and it goes down over top of the hive, and the hive sits up in here. Um, and then we slide it forward to let that little vent and that inner cover let the air out. Um, so there are some other kinds of covers. There's migratory tops as well that that are much cheaper, and they don't hang over the sides. They just they sit even, so you can set your hives up close together for moving them. But um, this is a uh, telescoping top. It's about 20 bucks as well. So I, uh, I failed to tell you how much some of that stuff was. That You might as well say 15 to 20 bucks on the queen excluder. You're going to say $2 a frame for each frame in each box, 10 frames per box. Um, so the frames are about a dollar and the foundation is about a dollar. So $2 per frame with foundation. Um, that box is probably 15 bucks. That box is about 12 or 13. So kind of putting that in perspective. Um, a good colony would have at minimum a deep and say four supers, four shallow supers on it during the honey flow. So that, that's kind of a minimum for a, a decently productive colony. I'm gonna kind of go ahead and put this together here. And I will come back to your questions here in just a second. I've seen some of you pop up some questions. Um, I'm going to get right to those. It looks like it's going to fall. So there we have a hive put together. All right, so feeding. There. So let me go back. Let me answer a question real quick. There was... So Kirk asked yeah, Kirk PBS, on. is there any state, city, local registration required for beekeeping? Is there a system that is required for beekeeping, small business requirements, or labeled as a hobby? <laughs> um, so, state, city, local registration. So, um, I sell bees, and in order to sell bees, I have to be registered with the state, and I have to be inspected. Um, if I was not selling bees, I would not have to register. Now, there are some things with pesticide applicators and things of that nature where we can register where our apiaries are at, and they're supposed to notify us and, and <laughs> let us know that they're spraying or aerial spraying or any of those, those things. Um, that's debatable whether or not it works. But um, So we uh, that's a registration. If there was an event where someone reported getting American fowl brood, so we can talk about it another time. Um, a state inspector would come out, no matter if you asked him or not, and they would have to check your bees. Um, trying to think if there's any other registration. So as far as honey labeling, there's some pretty basic regulations on that. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration doesn't get too involved because it's direct from producer or from the farm. Um, we label by weight, not volume. We have to have an origin statement. We have to say, you know, address and phone number of who, 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 made, who made the honey. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. And you can't, not anybody can just sell the honey. Yeah. So, and, and so like the North Carolina State Beekeepers Association, they have some 
one of the things they have is a certified honey producer and they validate that you are an actual North Carolina honey producer and that you're not buying honey from Argentina or China or somewhere like that and reselling it. So that's one of the one of the little things that can put a little sticker on there um, to say that you're a certified North Carolina honey producer. You have to label your honey for the type. It has to be 51% or greater of um, the nectar source that you label it as. So if we label honey as sirewood honey, it has to be at least 51% sirewood honey. And they have some testing labs that basically check the pollen content. Um, because all honey, if it's not microfiltered, has some of the pollen in it as well. And so they check the how much pollen is in there and, and of what different varieties of plants that, of the pollen that's in there. So in the spring, there's so many different things blooming that we label our honey spring wildflower because you know, it depends on the season. Sometimes it's primarily tulip poplar, sometimes it's primarily other things. So um, like, you know, like vetch. Um, Heaven forbid you get on some canola fields, their uh, the honey granulates really fast, but it's good honey. But um, So I'm going to jump into, I'll come back to some other questions here in a minute. Um, I'm going to jump into feeding. So everybody's asking about feeding. So I'll talk about feeders. That's the main thing I'm going to do. Here is a, here's one type of feeder. It's just, I mean, it's one of a million different types. This is a division board feeder and it would hang in the box just like the frames and there's little floats that just just sit there inside and well it would it would lay flat down on the honey but um and the bees can crawl down in there this edge is rough so the bees can crawl down in here get the sugar syrup and take it back out and feed or fill up their cells so this one is a division board feeder we also there's also a couple different styles of hive top feeders man we about lost it there um <laughs> couple styles of hive top feeders this would sit on top of the hive right underneath the telescoping cover and the bees would if you notice here the bees can come up from inside the hive they go up into the screened area and go down and drink the syrup that we would pour in here this is a plastic version of that same type feeder these are hive top feeders uh, I'll tell you some advantages to those in a moment and we have what's called a boardman feeder this slides right in the entrance I don't know if you can see so it would slide right in the entrance there and then you notice there's already a lid in there but you would uh, put the jar you'd screw that lid into the jar and it sits there and the bees come out of the hive and drink the syrups from there um, you don't have to have a fancy lid like that you can just take a regular mason jar lid and poke a few holes in it works pretty good so <clears throat> that's a boardman feeder some people argue that they promote robbing because the bees can come right in the side and go right right in and get to the syrup so you have to be careful with those um, but they they are effective you can see what's going on as the as the temperature goes up during the day though sometimes it forces the syrup out so we have to be careful with those type feeders um moving screen that's something nice to have if you ever have to move a hive it just sits right on the entrance and you can run the screws into it and hold that in there allows the bees to still breathe while you're moving them we can get into uh, moving bees a little more in another video that's a whole another topic um so did you answer John and Chris's question? So what was, give me a couple other questions. Um, well, Brandy asked, what is uncapping and pulling the comb away? So what is uncapping and pulling the comb away? So when the bees get the honey to 18% moisture content, 18.6, um, they, they will cap it with a wax capping. And that just kind of seals it away and it's, it's no longer exposed to moisture. So honey's like... Um, hypertrophic I think that's the right word for it so it, it attracts moisture uh, so we want to prevent it from getting any moisture once the bees have dried it down to that 18.6 and they cap it so when we get ready to extract the honey we have to slice that capping off we use a hot knife you can use a cold knife it doesn't matter hot knife's a little faster and they make fancy uncappers and all kinds of things but we would cut that we would cut that capping off 
and then we'll set it in the extractor and sling the frames around and around and around and then the honey comes out. So that's the uncapping process. Um, what's the next question? Um, did you get Chris's? Did you fully answer Chris's question? Who's, where is that at? Um, can you use sugar water to get through the winter if they don't make enough honey? Okay, so yeah, so that was, that was what prompted me to start talking about feeders. <laughs> so we always mix sugar water at weight, not volume. So that's very important. Um, there's, that's a commonly made mistake when, when we start mixing it, we think it's by volume and it's not. So, so when we say one to one sugar syrup, that is eight pounds of sugar to eight pounds of water. Eight pounds of water is a gallon, right? So eight pounds of sugar to one gallon of water. That's, that is the mix ratio for one to one. We use one to one for, um, like spring buildup. If there's not a good honey flow going on and we want to promote them to raise brood and and get started uh, maybe a little earlier than when the when we start getting some nectar flows we would give them one to one syrup so they would start raising brood and and the the, the bees the bee that one to one's getting down there a little bit closer to what a normal nectar flow is they they think that's they think they're getting it from a tree or or you know some kind of floral nectar source um some nectar sources are down as low as 10 or 11 percent but you know if we talk about one to one one part sugar one part water so 50 50 right um so the next mixture that's commonly used is is two to one and that's two parts sugar to one part water uh, so 16 pounds of sugar to a gallon and you can just imagine getting that much dissolved in a gallon of water becomes a little challenging so <clears throat> Uh, sometimes you have to warm it up just a little bit, but you can usually do two to one. You can't even do two and a half or three to one, and you definitely have to warm it up to do that. But two to one is what we use. That's that's getting closer to the the level that bees see to store. So if if we think back for just a moment where we said 18.6% moisture content is honey. Um, so if we have sugar water at two to one, that's 66% sugar and 33 percent water so we're getting really close to what it would be in the honey state so bees will take that and directly go and store it in the cells and dry it on down to that 18 percent and and so we use that especially in the fall if we have a if we have a hive of bees that is um, that doesn't have a full super of honey above their deep box on the bottom and they need at least 30 pounds or so to get through the winter. We would feed them some two to one sugar syrup and allow them to fill it up, fill that super up on that. Now, disclaimer, that's not a floral nectar source. And we have that sometimes, I believe, in some of this imported honey that we have is where people maybe um, are feeding their bees a, a sugar syrup and making honey. That's not technically honey. Honey has to be made by definition from a floral nectar source. So. Um, keep that in mind. You never want to feed while there's um, while you have honey supers on. It's just you know it's good practice. Um, in addition, there are a lot of little small properties. I don't want to dig too deep there in in the um, in the nectar. Little antiacids and things of that nature um, that that help the bees' immune system and various things like that. So. Nectar is better than sugar water. So when we go to feeding our bees, we just need to keep that in mind. If we have some honey supers on one, or honey frames on one hive, and we have none on the other, maybe we should give both hives a few of the few of the frames, and then feed them both to get them up, so they both get a little bit of it. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, so what's John another? Said, I've had my bees since the first of April. I have just a small hole at the entrance, maybe one and a half inches. When should I enlarge entrance to a hive? Yeah. So what you're talking about is an entrance reducer. I didn't talk about that. So we can we can restrict the bees down in the entrance to a really small hole. Um, we can flip it and allow them a little larger hole, or we can take it out and have the full 16 and a quarter inch width. Um, well, minus the three quarter on each side. But um, so <clears throat> an entrance reducer is, in my opinion, its primary use is to prevent robbing. Um, bees need ventilation. We don't need to restrict them too much. Uh, 
because they have moisture buildup. When they're fanning honey down during the honey flow, they have to be able to evacuate that moisture from the hive. And you'll see them line up. Some bees will be facing this way at one side and then the other bees will be facing this way and what they're doing is they're circulating air like this through that hive so we need to this time of year if you don't have robbing problems you need to take that out entirely um, it, it's really of no use if you have some robbing problems start restricting that interest down um, and that's you know that'll be that'll be acceptable so um, the bees need to see the light and that encourages them to work so that interest being open you know they see the light earlier so as long as you don't have robbing problems and the hives, you know, if you have a full hive and you have one frame of bees, okay, that's, you probably should leave this in here. But if you have four or five frames of bees or more out of a 10 frame hive, they don't need it this time of year. When you do need it is come summer dearth time or on out in the late fall. And some people run them all the way through the winter depending on their situation. So that's an entrance reducer. Uh, you can make them yourself or a couple bucks. <coughs> so uh so i've talked about the hive components i've talked about education i've talked about different tools and protective equipment i've talked a little bit about feeding um from some questions uh trying to think if i'm missing any basic things uh i don't think so so i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and jump over to see if there are any additional questions um I'm scrolling through here. How long should I feed my bees in the spring from John? Um, that That's a really common question that, that we get, especially when we sell a nuke. Well, how long do I need to feed this nuke? So um, in the spring, like right now, if we have days like today, where it was you know, near 80 degrees, 75, 80 degrees, the bees worked a lot. There's plenty of nectar out there. You have tulip poplar trees blooming. You have vetch blooming, you have blackberries blooming, you have clover blooming. There's a lot of nectar sources out there. The bees will hardly take the feed because they would rather have real floral nectar. So, <clears throat> but if we look back to yesterday and the day before and the day before that, when it was highs in the mid fifties or lower, it was windy, it was raining. At that point, we could feed those bees one-to-one -one sugar water and, and allow them to think the, the nectar source is still coming in every day and that queen's going to continue to lay to a high productive level um, and, and the bees are going to continue to draw new comb and all these things. So my answer to that is uh, it depends. So we, I don't, I, uh, I take that out of Dewey Karen's book. He, uh, he, uh, he said that at the state meeting a lot in his last speech, he said he would, he would ask a question and then he would say, well, it depends. Well, it depends. So it does. So early, if we get back, if we're in February and we're trying to push our bees, you know, we're feeding cause there's not a lot out there unless you got the red maple starting to bloom and they have weather they can work. If it's, um, if you have good weather and it's now, they're probably not going to take the feed. So if you have a new hive, if you have that, that doesn't have all the comb drawn out, doesn't have much honey stores, I would say put feed on them. And if they take it, keep giving it to them. If they stop taking it, that means they're making something else that they like better. So that's kind of my answer to that. Feed them if they'll take it in the spring. Okay. He asked, how often should I check my hive? Um, so how often should I check my hive? For inspection so <clears throat> I've answered that question a couple times as well so so if you have an established hive and, and all of our hives are in one one or you know close locations they're not spread out in the spring during swarm season they need to be checked about every 10 days uh, that allows you to verify that they're not going they're not in swarming mode they don't have queen cells drawn down and starting um, you know various things like that so 10 days is good you know now if you have out apiaries you have an apiary in the mountains and one in the piedmont you know you got to drive well you're, you're probably not going to check them every 10 days so because you just can't get there um but what i tell a lot of new beekeepers uh, i'm not sure where where you where you're at in, in your endeavors but what i tell a lot of new beekeepers is there's there's no way to learn how to observe what's happening on from the outside of the hive until you know what's going on, on the inside and are able to compare what you saw on the outside that that might have been kind of weird but um so when i see when i walk up to a colony and i see pollen coming in the door so bees are carrying pollen on their legs um 
in, in, in their pollen baskets that if they're carrying pollen in, that tells me the queen's laying because baby bees and larvae need pollen. That's their protein. So I can look at the outside of the hive. I see them bringing pollen in, the queen's laying. If a hive's sitting idle and the hive beside of them is working, it tells me there's something off in that hive. And a lot of times a queenless hive kind of gives up hope and they don't work. So um, that's that's another thing I look at. Um, we're looking at colony strength on the front of the colonies. I can lift the lid, you know, and listen. Do the bees roar when I open the lid or do they stay quiet? If they roar, you know, it might be a queenless condition or something like that. So there's a lot of things that you can learn to observe from the outside or minimal inspections, but you have to dig in when you're learning in order to gain that experience and knowledge. So I encourage people as new beekeepers to go in their bees. I mean, at least once a week. I, I don't see a problem with going in your bees once a week and learning what's going on and learning the times of the year and how things progress throughout the year and being able to compare what you saw sitting outside of the hive the day before to what you're seeing inside the hive today. So <clears throat> every week, minimum 10 days during the spring, as we get on out in the summer, um, you can back those inspections down to maybe every couple weeks. And then as we get closer to winter, things change as well. You need to make sure they have honey stores, make sure they're still queen right, and then we kind of start leaving them alone. And then, you know, first time we get a decent day, maybe in January or February, we need to check them. Uh, I, I see so many people, and my dad will back me up on this, that, that wait until the end of April or mid-April to check their bees for the first time in the year. You got to do it. Um, you got to do it the first day that you can. Most bees that starve to death, they they or that run out of honey in their colony, that happens in February because they started ramping up brood production and they used up all their honey. So if we're not checking them in January or February, we don't see that. So <clears throat> that's how we are inspecting. Nate, for the first thing. Nate, when do you add a super? Uh, so, so are you talking honey super or are you talking um, the feed super? I guess that's the, I'll kind of answer both. So we're talking about the deep on the bottom and then we put a super. So if you bought a nuke and you had five frames, as, the, as that colony is drawing the 10th frame of foundation, we would add the next box to it. Now, that next box should technically be theirs you could run it through the season without that feed super and add it later um but i would add that next super as they're drawing as they've started drawing that last frame now keep in mind a good colony a colony that's growing rapidly this time of year they can draw that frame in a day so with a good honey flow like we have going on so you have to keep an eye on them um, it may not be a full scale inspection but it may be you walk by the hive and you lift the lid off and you look and you see where the bees are covering and you put the lid back on. You, so honey supers, we got we, we have to know our, our timing for the year. I use the date April 21st around here as the opening of the tulip poplar honey flow. That's in you know the Piedmont um, and it's variable of course, but that's the primary honey we start making in the spring. Now, uh, the vetch and some of those other things bloom a little bit earlier than that or start blooming the clovers blooming a little bit earlier than that so you, sh you could be making honey a little before that so if the if the hive is is strong and they filled up that hive that you have below and they're needing room add that next super and get what you can get you know as long as you're not around a canola field you don't want to get canola in your honey supers because it granulates really bad but um <clears throat> yeah go ahead and add that super and see what they do Sometimes you may have to leave that that uh, that uh, the queen excluder out for a couple days until the bees get to working in there, and then put the queen excluder in and make sure your queen's below it. But yeah, go ahead and add it as soon as they uh, as soon as soon as they look like they're needing that room, give them room, or they're going to want to swarm on you. So um, that's that. Chris wants to know when is a good time to check for mites. All right, so mites. That so, I should have said that in the beginning when we're talking about education. We need to read up on a few very um, important things. One is the varroa disruptor mite, and the other is American foulbrood. We need to know what American foulbrood is. I hope you never get it, um, but you need to know what it is because one of the most deadly 
um, diseases that bees come down with and it's pretty much a destruct at that point if your hive gets it and uh, the state is very very um, active in dealing with with American foulbrood so um, but make sure you read up on varroa mites uh, varroa mites they're a little parasite and they reproduce in the cells as the bees um, as they go through the larva and then into the pupa stage and then they in the phoretic stage there they'll feed off of the um, off of the bee I think I think now they're saying they feed off the fat bodies and not the hemolymph but the hemolymph is the blood but I think they're now saying to feed off the, the uh, fat bodies but they'll be in their spiracles and places on their abdomen and hard to see so we have to check the bees and see what their mite loads are um, two primary times we check is in the spring and in the fall the fall is as soon as we can get honey supers off so if you take your bees for sirewood somewhere as soon as you can get those honey supers off um, we need to be looking at mites and starting to check them um, we can so that that's going to be like the first of august um, we're going to be checking for mites for fall the sooner you get your treatments on the better if you if they, if they're needed um, because those bees that are starting to be raised then are your winter bees that have to live all the way through the winter and those uh if those bees were raised under conditions in a cell where a mite was in there you know feeding off of off of them as a larva then that bee's not going to be as healthy as an adult so we need to get those treatments on early and get rid of those mites as much as possible you're never going to completely get rid of them but um and then also we would check for them in the spring as soon as as soon as we can get in them because they're going to start raising brood around the winter solstice and then they will um at that point the mites will will begin reproducing as well but if we look at a chart you can look at a lot of these charts up online but if you look at a chart as the bee population increases the mite load will increase behind it and then as the bee population rolls off as we're getting into the fall the mite population lags behind so we end up in this period where we have fewer bees and tons of mites on fewer bees so the fall is really critical and there's a million different methods that we can use out there for treatment um, and there's a couple different methods we can use for uh, testing there's uh, sticky boards um, I, I've not used that method honestly I can't really speak to it um, but we have the sugar shake method um, and then we have the alcohol wash so we want to keep that number down around three mites per hundred bees when we when we do our checking um, <clears throat> Three mites per hundred bees is what the you know the authorities that bee have considered kind of the the acceptable level where a colony can can deal with it. Um, so we we can use different methods for treatment. There are synthetic chemicals. There are natural, more natural or organic chemicals um, that we can use. And you know the main thing is we need to use them on a on label basis because it is a pesticide. So. Uh, we have to use them by the label you know we have oxalic acids we have apivar we have uh, apolife bar we have uh, you know just there's a whole list of, of different ones that we can use and you have to read on those individually you know some of them have uh, temperature restrictions on when you can put them in the hive some have uh, whether or not your honey supers are on or not you know to whether or not you can use that chemical at that time um, some have an efficacy level that's a little bit too low you know maybe in the 80 percent efficacy levels you know i like to get on up there in the 90s so um, we have to keep all those things in mind it's kind of a complete topic on itself um, to start talking about mites and dealing with mites but we need to be checking them in the spring as early as feasible you know february march and we need to be checking and treating them in the fall around august and and i will say that the majority of the time they will need a treatment in the fall you know I'm, I'm saying you need to check and and then you need to treat if need be and then you need to check to make sure your treatment was effective so um, that's uh but fall the the mite load is high 90 percent of the time so billy wants to know um just that average cost for someone wanting to raise bees to get started yeah so we we kind of went through numbers earlier but not 
completely. So yeah, I didn't really total it up. So we the going rate for nukes is is one hundred seventy five dollars, and that's a five that's five deep frames with bees and brood and a queen. That's one hundred seventy five dollars. Now you can buy a package for about one hundred twenty five, and that's uh, three pounds of bees with a queen. Um, so two different startup methods. But then we have to buy our gear and we have to buy our hive. So our gear is going to get up there around mm, at least 150 bucks. Probably should just go ahead and say 200. So let's just say 200 for the bees, 200 for the gear, and that's those are high numbers. Um, so that's 400 bucks, and then we're going to have another hundred. And I mean, if we have a a twenty dollar bottom board, Heather added up twenty dollar bottom board. Uh, uh, a fifteen dollar hive body, and we have three thirteen dollar supers. You still with me? Mm -hmm. And then we have a ten dollar inner cover and a twenty dollar telescoping cover. We have a twenty dollar queen excluder, and then we have I said three supers and a hive body, so we're going to end up with forty frames. At two dollars a piece, so eighty dollars worth of frames and foundation. How much is that? About six hundred dollars. Total. That was including the gear and everything. Yeah, so five hundred, six hundred bucks maybe. Um, I I think you could probably do a little bit better than that for for a hive, but um, again, there's economy to scale. So and so there's if we buy our first beehive and we're buying all of our gear and everything else, then we don't have to do that the second go round. We just buy another beehive. And what if we don't have to buy a nuke next time? Instead, we make a divide off of one of our current hives. So, if we do that, then you know we're saving we're saving one hundred seventy five dollars for a new nuke, and we're not having to buy the gear for another two hundred dollars. So, you know, next hive may only be one hundred and fifty bucks or a hundred bucks. So, yeah, again, the economy is scaled there. So, I, I would think you're probably going to have about five hundred in the first one, and then. A couple hundred in, in those thereafter. So, I think we can that are there any other questions? Yeah, I'm not no. seeing any. I think we've caught. If I missed anybody, please let me know. Um, and and while I'm, I'm gonna give you just a few more minutes to ask any questions, uh, like uh, like I said earlier, please go to the YouTube channel. I plan on doing this on YouTube next time. Um, it just was not cooperating today. Um, but I need to get, I need you to subscribe to that channel so you'll get notified and it'll also open up some doors for me to be able to do some other things as I get more subscribers on there. So I'd, I'd really appreciate you jumping on there and hitting the subscribe button. Go to, um, go to, um, if you go to my Facebook page, Dyson Apiaries, there is a link to the YouTube channel there. And there's also a subscribe button. If you wouldn't mind hitting that, um, and share that for me, please. Um, again, that's one of my goals was to uh, to help educate and help new people get into beekeeping. Uh, I think it's really rewarding. Uh, you don't have to have 200 hives; you can have two, and get yourself, a, you know, some a couple gallons of honey every year. Maybe share with your neighbor and have some honey for yourself. Uh, you're helping your garden, you know, pollinating those uh, melon crops and things like that for your cucumbers and maybe your apple trees and and things like that. Um, I think it's, you know it's really good for the environment. So you know it's good for it's good for a lot of people to have a few bees than a few people to have a lot of bees. You know, that's one one beekeeper with a thousand hives sitting in one place doesn't do your garden any good. So that's that's one of the things. I, you know, back in the day. My dad says it all the time. People used to could have bees. My great grandpa and my grandpa, or my great grandpa had bees. He didn't have to keep bees. He could go out there and rob the honey, and then the bees would be fine. He didn't have to treat them for mites. All that stuff wasn't here. So now we have to really actively manage that. And um, so, John wants to know. He was told he should start with two hives instead of one, and he did. Yeah. So. so yeah, so with, with two hives, the, the advantage to two hives is, for, for one, it's just like, a, it's just like, I'll use this, it's kind of a stupid analogy, but if, if we, if we buy, if we buy one cow, 
all right we buy you know this heifer cow or whatever that we're growing out if we just have one we have nothing to compare it to so we don't know how well it's growing is it growing at the correct rate you know or is it the size it should be we can't compare right but if we have two now we can say okay this one's doing better than this one what is wrong with this one or what is off how can i improve this one right so we have we have that comparison for uh we have that comparison issue there that we can use the other thing is is that if you have one colony one colony only and it loses its queen now i have nothing to try to save this colony with so say i call my local bee supplier and i need a, I need a queen because my queen's my, my my hive just went queenless so i call my call my local guy and he says i can't get you one for two weeks or three weeks all right uh, that's pretty common in the spring because everybody's sold out so if he tells you that now what if you only have one one hive and there's no brood left so they can't raise them another queen so if you had that other hive now you could take a frame of young larva or eggs and put into that queenless hive and at least they could raise them another queen you know it may not be the most ideal conditions to raise a queen but they don't die all right so that's why you have two colonies at minimum and that's that's my opinion i will agree with whoever told you that you you should at least have two colonies and you Plus, you know, if you lose one and you only have one, you got nothing. If you if you lose one and you had two, you still have one. You can make a divide next spring and go back to two. So, um, and not have to buy more bees. I mean, we we love it when people come buy bees from us, but that's not the goal. You know, we want people to be able to keep bees alive. So, um, I agree with that. Any any other questions? Terry said, "Don't forget the mite treatment." Yeah, costs. you're right. Mite treatment costs can add up uh, significantly. I'm not going to dig into that too much. We may do an entire video on um, on mite, uh, you know, dealing with mites, um, because there's so many different so many different treatment methods out there, and um, so many different types of chemicals. And but that that treatment cost can add up, especially depending on how many hives you're doing. So yes, that is a good statement. Any other questions? all right so i think we've been on here a little over an hour and that was a little longer than i planned on being on here but um i appreciate you guys joining and signing on with us um i'll do another one here in the next week or so I, I, i'm not sure exactly what the next topic's going to be i hadn't made up my mind yet so um it's a little easier to do this than it is to to blog um this time of year i'll blog in the winter time and i'll video this time of year so um I hope this was helpful, especially for any of you trying to get into beekeeping as, as a new new hobby and maybe some of the more experienced. Hope you learned something. Um, share if you don't mind, and um, maybe we can uh, help some other people that may not be my friends, you know, on Facebook or anywhere else that may need a little bit of help or a good start. Um, might be, uh, hope, hopefully it'll be helpful. So I'm going to jump off here, and I appreciate, like I said, I appreciate you guys signing on. and. I look for you next time.